It is Tuesday, January 5th, 9.37 p.m. We're reading Liber V. Valreguli, or Liber V. Valreguli, the Book of the Prince, otherwise known as the Book of the King, since Regulus also means king. This is an AA publication in Class D, being the ritual of the Mark of the Beast, an incantation proper to invoke the energies of the Eon of Horus, adapted for the daily use of the magician of whatever grade. The first gesture, the Oath of the Enchantment which is also called the Elevenfold Seal, the animadversion towards the Eon. Let the magician, robed and armed as he may deem to be fit, turn his face towards Beleskin, that is, the house of the beast, sits at six. Let him strike the battery. Let him put the thumb of his right hand between its index and medius, and make the gestures hereafter following. The vertical component of the enchantment. Let him describe a circle about his head, crying, Nuit. Let him draw the thumb vertically downward and touch the Muladhara chakra, crying, Hadit. Let him, retracing the line, touch the center of his breast and cry, Rahurquit. The horizontal components of the enchantment. Let him touch the center of his forehead, his mouth, and his larynx, crying, I was. Let him draw his thumb from right to left across his face at the level of the nostrils. Let him touch the center of his breast and his solar plexus, crying, Therion. Let him draw his thumb from left to right across his breast at the level of the sternum. Let him touch the Svadhisthana and the Muladhara Chakra, crying, Babalon. Let him draw his thumb from right to left across his abdomen at the level of the hips. Thus shall he formulate the cross of the Grand Arafant, but dependent from the circle. The Asservation of the Spells Let the magician clasp his hands upon his wand, his fingers and his thumbs interlaced, crying, Lashtal Dalima Thus shall be declared the words of power whereby the energies of the Aeon of Horus work his will in the world. The proclamation of the accomplishment. Let the magician strike the battery. Crying, Abra-dabra. The second gesture. The enchantment. Let the magician, still facing Beleskin, advance to the circumference of his circle. Let him turn himself towards the light, and pace with the stealth and swiftness of a tiger the precincts of his circle, until he has complete one revolution thereof. Let him give the sign of Horus, or the Enterer, as he passeth, so to project the force that radiateth from Beleskin before him. Let him pace his path until he comes to the north. There let him halt and turn his face to the north. Let him trace with his wand the averse pentagram proper to invoke air, or Aquarius. Let him bring the wand to the center of the pentagram and call upon Nuit. Let him make the call, called Puella, standing with his feet together, head bowed, his left hand shielding the Muladhara Chakra, and his right hand shielding his breast, attitude of the Venus de Medici. Let him turn again to the left and pursue a path as before. Projecting the force from Beleskin as he passeth, let him halt when next cometh to the south, and turn and face outward. Let him trace the averse pentagram that invoketh fire, or Leo. Let him point his wand to the center of the pentagram and cry, Hadid. Let him give the sign Puer, standing with his feet together and head erect. Let his right hand, the thumb extended at right angles to the fingers, be raised the forearm vertical at a right angle with the upper arm, which is horizontally extended in the line joining the shoulders. Let his left hand, the thumb extended forwards and his fingers clenched, rest at the junction of the thighs, 
attitude of the gods Mentu, Kem, etc. Let him proceed as before, then in the east. Let him make the averse pentagram that invoketh earth, or Taurus. Let him point his wand to the center of the pentagram and cry, Virion. Let him give the sign called Vir. The feet being together, the hands with clenched fingers and thumbs thrust forwards are held to the temples. The head is then bowed and pushed out, as if to symbolize the budding of a horned beast, attitude of Pan, Bacchus, etc. Proceeding as before, let him make in the west the averse pentagram whereby water is invoked. Pointing the wand to the center of the pentagram, let him call upon Babylon. Let him give the sign Mulier, or Mulier. The feet are widely separated and the arms raised so as to suggest a crescent. The head is thrown back, attitude of Baphomet, Isis and Welcome, the microcosm of Vitruvius. Let him break into the dance, tracing a centripetal spiral of Wittershins, enriched by revolutions upon his axis as he passeth each quarter, until he comes to the center of the circle. There, let him halt, facing Boleskin. Let him raise the wand, trace the mark of the beast, and cry, I was... Let him trace the invoking hexagram of the beast. Let him lower the wand, striking the earth therewith. Let him give the sign of Mater Triumphans. The feet are together, the left arm is curved, as if it supported a child. The thumb and index finger of the right hand pinch the nipple of the left breast, as if offering it to that child. Let him utter the word, Thalima. Perform the spiral dance, moving deosil and whirling widdershins. Each time on passing the west, extend the wand to the quarter in question and bow. Before me the powers of La to the west. Before me the powers of All to the east. On my right hand, the powers of La to north. On my left hand, the powers of All to south. Above me, the powers of Set, leaping in the air. Beneath me, the powers of Set, striking the ground. Within me, the powers. In the attitude of Ta, erect, the feet together, the hands clasped upon the vertical wand. About me flames my father's face, the star of force and fire. And in the column stands his six-rayed splendor. This dance may be omitted, and the whole utterance chanted in the attitude of Ta. The final gesture. This is identical with the first gesture. Here followeth an impression of the ideas implied in this paean. I also am a star in space, unique and self-existent, an individual essence incorruptible. I also am one soul. I am identical with all and none. I am in all and all in me. I am apart from all and Lord of all and one with all. I am a God, I very God of a very God. I go upon my way to work my will. I have made matter and motion for my mirror. I have decreed for my delight that nothingness should figure itself as twain that I might dream a dance of names and natures and enjoy the substance of simplicity by watching the wanderings of my shadows. I am not that which is not. I know not that which knows not. I love not that which loves not. For I am love, whereby division dies in delight. I am knowledge, whereby all parts, plunged in the whole, perish and pass into perfection. And I am that I am, the being wherein being is lost in nothing, nor designs to be, but by its will to unfold its nature its need to express in perfection in all possibilities, each phase a partial phantasm, and yet inevitable and absolute. I am omniscient, for naught exists for me unless I know it. I am omnipotent, for naught occurs save by necessity, my soul's expression through my will to be, to do, to suffer the symbols of itself. I am omnipresent, for naught exists where I am not, who fashions space as a condition for my consciousness of myself, who am the center of all, and my circumference the frame of mine own fancy. I am the all, for all that exists for me is a necessary expression in thought of some tendency of my nature, and all my thoughts are only the letters of my name. I am the one, for all that I am is not the absolute all, and all my all is mine, and not another's, mine, who conceive of others like myself in essence and truth, yet unlike in expression and illusion. I am the none, for all that I am is the imperfect image of the perfect. Each partial phantom must perish in the clasp of its counterpart. Each form fulfill itself by binding its equated opposite, and satisfying its need to be the absolute by the attainment of annihilation. The word la chetal 
includes all this. Law, not. All, two. L is justice, the catius, fulfilled by the phallus. Not and two, because the plus and the minus have united in love under will. A is the fool, not in thought, Parzival, word, Harpocrates, and action, botches. He is the boundless heir and the wandering ghost, but with possibilities. He is the knot that the two have made by love under will. La thus represents the ecstasy of Nui and Hadith conjoined, lost in love, and making themselves not thereby. Their child is begotten and conceived, but is in the phase of not also, as yet. La is thus the universe in that phase, with its potentialities of manifestation. All, on the contrary, though it is essentially identical with La, shows the fool manifested through the equilibrium of contraries. The weight is still nothing, but it is expressed as if it were two equal weights in opposite scales. The indicator still points to zero. Set is equally 31, with law and all, but it expresses the secret nature which operates the magic or the transmutations. Set is the formula of this particular eon. Another eon might have another way of saying 31. Shin is fire, as teth is force. Conjoined, they express rahur tui. The angel represents the stella sits at six, showing the gods of the eon, while strength is a picture of Babylon and the beast, the earthly emissaries of those gods. Set is the dynamic equivalent of law and all. Shin shows the word of the law being triple, as 93 is thrice 31. Teth shows the formula of magic declared in that word. The lion, the serpent, the sun, courage, and sexual love are all indicated by the card. In La, note that Saturn or Satan is exalted in the house of Venus or Astarte, and it is an airy sign. Thus, La Med is father-mother, two and not, and the spirit, Holy Ghost, of their love is also not. Love is a Haba, thirteen, which is a Chad. Unity, one, Aleph, who is the fool, who is not, but nonetheless an individual one, who as such is not another, yet unconscious of himself until his oneness expresses itself as a duality. Any impression or idea is unknowable in itself. It can mean nothing until brought into relation with other things. The first step is to distinguish one thought from another. This is the condition of recognizing it. To define it, we must perceive its origination, its orientation to all other ideas. The extent of our knowledge of any one thing varies, therefore, with the number of ideas with which we can compare it. Every new fact not only adds itself to our universe, but increases the value of what we already possess. In all, this, the, or God, arranges the countenance to behold countenance, by establishing itself as an equilibrium. A, or Aleph, the one not conceived as El, or Lamed, the two not. This Lamed is the son-daughter Horus Harpocrates, just as the other Lamed was the father-mother set Isis. Here then is Tetragrammaton once more, but expressed in identical equations, in which every term is perfect in itself as a mode of not. Set supplies the last element, making the word of either five or six letters, according as we regard set as one letter or two. Thus the word affirms the great work accomplished, five six. Set is moreover a necessary revolution of the apparent opposition of law and all, for one could hardly pass to the other without the catalytic action of a third identical expression whose function should be to transmute them. Such a term must be in itself a mode of not, and its nature cannot encroach on the perfections of not being, law, or of being, all. It must be purely nothing motion, as they are purely nothing matter, so as to create a matter in motion which is a function of something. Thus set is motion in its double phase, an inertia composed of two opposite currents, and each current is also thus polarized. Shin is heaven and earth, teth male and female. Shin is spirit and matter. One is the word of liberty and love, flashing its light to restore life to earth. The other is the act by which life claims that love is light and liberty. And these are two in one, the divine letter of silence and speech, whose symbol is the sun in the arms of the moon. But Shin and Teth are alike formulae of force in action, as opposed to entities. They are not states of existence, but modes of motion. They are verbs, not nouns. Shin is the Holy Spirit as a tongue of fire manifest in triplicity, and is the child of Set Isis as their logos or word uttered by their angel. The card is 20, and 20 is the value of Yod, the secret seed of all things, the Virgin, the Hermit, Mercury, the Angel, or Herald. Expressed in full as Yod, Vav, Daleth. Shin is the spiritual congress of heaven and earth. But Teth is the Holy Spirit in action as a roaring lion, or as the old serpent, instead of as an angel of light. The twins of Set Isis, Harlot and Beast, are busy with that sodomatic and incestuous lust which is the traditional formula for producing demigods, as in the cases of Mary and the Dove, Leda and the Swan, etc. The card is nine, the number of magic, odd, 
Aleph the fool impregnating the woman according to the word of Yod, the angel of the Lord. His sister has seduced her brother beast, shaming the sun with her sin. She has mastered the lion and enchanted the serpent. Nature is outraged by magic. Man is bestialized and woman defiled. The conjunction produces a monster. It affirms the regression of types. Instead of a man-god conceived of the spirit of God by a virgin in innocence, we are asked to adore the bastard of a whore and a brute, begotten in shamefulest sin and born in most blasphemous bliss. This is in fact the formula of our magic. We insist that all acts must be equal, that existence asserts the right to exist, that unless evil is a mere term expressing some relation of haphazard hostility between forces equally self-justified, the universe is as inexplicable and impossible as uncompensated action, that the orgies of Bacchus and Pan are no less sacramental than the masses of Jesus, that the scars of syphilis are sacred and worthy of honor as much as the wounds of the martyrs of Mary. It should be unnecessary to insist that the above ideas apply only to the absolute. Toothache is still painful, and deceit degrading to a man relatively to his situation in the world of illusion, he does his will by avoiding them. But the existence of evil is fatal to philosophy so long as it is supposed to be independent of conditions, and to accustom the mind to make no difference between any two ideas, as such as to emancipate it from the thraldom of terror. We affirm on our altars our faith in ourselves and our wills, our love of all aspects of the absolute all. And we make the spirit Shin combined with the flesh Teth into a single letter whose value is 31, even as those of La, the Not, and All, the All, to complete their not being and being with its becoming, to meditate between identical extremes as their mean, the secret that sunders and seals them. It declares that all somethings are equally shadows of nothing and justifies nothing in its futile folly of pretending that something is stable, by making us aware of a method of magic through the practice of which we may partake in the pleasure of the process. The magician should devise for himself a definite technique for destroying evil. The essence of such a practice will consist in training the mind and the body to confront things which cause fear, pain, disgust, shame, and the like. He must learn to endure them, then to become indifferent to them, then to analyze them until they give pleasure and instruction, and finally to appreciate them for their own sake as aspects of truth. When this has been done, he should abandon them if they are really harmful in relation to health or comfort. Also, our selection of evils is limited to those that cannot damage us irreparably. E.g., one ought to practice smelling asafoetida until one likes it, but not arsine or hydrocyanic acid. Again, one might have a liaison with an ugly old woman until one beheld and loved the star which she is. It would be too dangerous to overcome the distaste for honesty by forcing oneself to pick pockets. Acts which are essentially dishonorable must not be done. They should be justified only by calm contemplation on their correctness in abstract cases. Love is a virtue. It grows stronger and purer and less selfish by applying it to what it loathes. But theft is a vice involving the slave idea that one's neighbor is superior to oneself. It is admirable only for its power to develop certain moral and mental qualities in primitive types. To prevent the atrophy of such faculties as our own vigilance and for the interest which it adds to the tragedy, man. Crime, folly, sickness, and all such phenomena must be contemplated with complete freedom from fear, aversion, or shame. Otherwise, we shall fail to see accurately and interpret intelligently, in which case we shall be unable to outwit and outfight them. Anatomists and physiologists grappling in the dark with death have won hygiene, surgery, prophylaxis, and the rest for mankind. Anthropologists, archaeologists, physicists, and other men of science risking thumbscrew, stake, infamy, and ostracism have torn the spider snare of superstition to shreds and broken in pieces the monstrous idol of morality, the murderous Moloch, which has made mankind its meat throughout history. Each fragment of that copper light is manifest as an image of some brute lust, some torpid dullness, some ignorant instinct, or some furtive fear shaping in its own savage mind. Man is indeed not wholly freed, even now. He is still trampled under the hooves of the stampeding mules that nightmare bore to his wild ass. His creative forces that he had not mastered, the sterile ghosts that he called gods. Their mystery cows men still. They fear, they flinch, they dare not face the phantoms. Still, too, the fallen fetish seems awful. It is frightful to them that there is no longer an idol to adore with anthems and to appease with the flesh of their firstborn. Each scrambles in the bloody mire of the floor to snatch some scrap for a relic that he may bow down to and serve it. So, even today, a mass of maggots swarm heaving over the carry on earth, a brotherhood bound by blind greed for rottenness. Science still hesitates to raise the Temple of Ramon, though every year finds more of her sons impatient of Naaman's prudence. The Privy Council of the Kingdom of Mansoul sits in permanent secret session, 
It dares not declare what must follow its deed in shattering the monarch morality into scraps of crumbling conglomerate of climatic, tribal, and personal prejudices, corrupted yet more by the action of crafty ambition, insane impulses, ignorant arrogance, superstitious hysteria, fear-fashioning falsehoods on the stone that it sets on the grave of truth whom it has murdered and buried in the black earth oblivion. Moral philosophy, psychology, sociology, anthropology, mental pathology, physiology, and many another of the children of wisdom of whom she is justified well know that the laws of ethics are a chaos of confused conventions, based at best on customs convenient in certain conditions, more often on the craft or caprice of the biggest, the most savage, heartless, cunning, and bloodthirsty brutes of the pack, to secure their power or pander to their pleasure and cruelty. There is no principle, even a false one, to give coherence to the clamor of ethical propositions. Yet the very men who have smashed Moloch and strewn the earth with shapeless rubble grow pale when they so much as whisper among themselves. While Moloch ruled, all men were bound by one law, and by the oracles of them that, knowing their fraud, feared not, but were his priests and wardens of his mystery. What now? How can any of us, though wise and strong as never was known, prevail on men to act in concert? Now that each prays to his own chip of God, and yet knows every other chip to be worthless ort, dream dust, ape dung, tradition bone, or what not else. So science begins to see that the initiates were maybe not merely silly and selfish in making their rule of silence, and in protecting philosophy from the profane. Yet still she hopes that the mischief may not prove mortal, and begs that things may go on much as usual until the secret session decide on some plan of action. It has always been fatal when somebody finds out too much too suddenly. If John Huss had cackled more like a hen, he might have survived Michaelmas, and been esteemed for his eggs. The last fifty years have laid the acts of analysis to the root of every axiom. They are trifflers who content themselves with lopping the blossoming twigs of our beliefs or the bows of our intellectual instruments. We can no longer assert any single proposition unless we guard ourselves by enumerating countless conditions which must be assumed. The digression has outstayed its welcome. It was only invited by wisdom that it might warn rashness of the dangers that encompass even sincerity, energy, and intelligence when they happen not to contribute to fitness in their environment. The magician must be wary in his use of his powers. He must make every act not only accord with his will, but with the proprieties of his position at the time. It might be my will to reach the foot of a cliff, but the easiest way, also the speediest, most direct, least obstructed, the way of minimum of effort, would be simply to jump. I should have destroyed my will in the act of fulfilling it, or what I mistook for it. For the true will has no goal, its nature being to go. Similarly, a parabola is bound by one law, which fixes its relations with two straight lines at every point. Yet it has no end short of infinity, and it continually changes its direction. The initiate who is aware who he is can always check his conduct by referring to the determinants of his curve, and calculate his past, his future, his bearings, and his proper course at any assigned moment. He can even comprehend himself as an idea. He may attain to measure fellow parabolas, ellipses that cross his path, hyperbolas that span all space with their twin wings. Perhaps he may come at long last, leaping beyond the limits of his own law, to conceive that sublimely stupendous outrage to reason, the cone. Utterly inscrutable to him, he is yet well aware that he exists in the nature thereof, that he is necessary thereto, that he is ordered thereby, and that therefrom he is sprung from the loins of so fearful a father. His own infinity becomes zero in relation to that of the least fragment of the solid. He hardly exists at all. Trillions multiplied by trillions of trillions such as he could not cross the frontier even of breadth, the idea which he came to guess at only because he felt himself bound by some mysterious power. Yet breadth is equally a nothing in the presence of the cone. His first conception must evidently be a frantic spasm, formless, insane, not to be classed as articulate thought. Yet if he develops the faculties of his mind, the more he knows of it, the more he sees that its nature is identical with his owner whenever comparison is possible. The true will is thus both determined by its equations and free because those equations are simply its own name, spelt out fully. His sense of being under bondage comes from his inability to read it. His sense that evil exists to thwart him arises when he begins to learn to read, reads wrong, and is obstinate that his error is an improvement. We know one thing only. Absolute existence, absolute motion, absolute direction, absolute simultaneity, absolute truth, all such ideas, they have not and never can have any real meaning. If a man in delirium tremens fell into the Hudson River, he might remember the proverb and clutch at an imaginary straw. Words such as truth are like that straw. 
confusion of thought is concealed and its impotence denied by the invention. This paragraph opened with we know, yet questioned, we make haste to deny the possibility of possessing or even defining knowledge. What could be more certain to a parabola philosopher than that he could be approached in two ways and two only? It would be indeed little less than the whole body of his knowledge, implied in the theory of his definition of himself, and confirmed by every single experience. He could receive impressions only by meeting A, or being caught up by B. Yet he would be wrong in any infinite number of ways. There are therefore aleph zero possibilities that any moment a man may find himself totally transformed. And it may be that our present dazzled bewilderment is due to our recognition of the existence of a new dimension of thought, which seems so inscrutably infinite and absurd and immoral, etc., because we have not studied it long enough to appreciate that its laws are identical with our own, though extended to new conceptions. The discovery of radioactivity created a momentary chaos in chemistry and physics, but it soon led to a fuller interpretation of the old ideas. It dispersed many difficulties, harmonized many discords, and yeah, more. It showed the substance of the universe as a simplicity of light and life, possessed of limitless liberty to enjoy love, by combining its units in various manners to compose atoms, themselves capable of deeper self-realization through, through fresh complexities and organizations, each with its own peculiar powers and pleasures, each pursuing its path through the world where all things are possible. It revealed the omnipresence of Hadith identical with himself, yet fulfilling himself by dividing his interplay with Nuit into episodes, each form of his energy isolated with each aspect of her receptivity, delight developing delight continuous from complex to complex. It was the voice of nature awakening at the dawn of the eon, as Iwas uttered the word of the law of Thelema. So also shall he who invoketh often behold the formless fire, with trembling and bewilderment. But if he prolong his meditation, he shall resolve it into coherent and intelligible symbols, and he shall hear the articulate utterance of that fire, interpret the thunder thereof as a still small voice in his heart. And the fire shall reveal to his eyes his own image in its own true glory, and it shall speak in his ears the mystery that is his own right name. This then is the virtue of the magic of the beast 666, and the canon of its proper usage, to destroy the tendency to discriminate between any two things in theory, and in practice to pierce the veils of every sanctuary pressing forward to embrace every image, for there is none that is not very Isis. The inmost is one with the inmost, yet the form of the one is not the form of the other. Intimacy exacts fitness. He therefore who liveth by air, let him not